switched to uh, PowerPoint, right? Yes. Yeah. Seeing the PowerPoint. Good. So uh, I, I want to talk today about uh, what what I call a systematic approach to harmonic stability analysis. So I guess most of you have heard the word harmonic stability before, uh, and it is kind of an emerging topic still. Uh, it's about, say, uh, converter interactions, control interactions related uh, to converters that uh, we are seeing more and more. Uh, I, a lot of the literature on this topic has been done, has been describing impedance-based approaches to doing that. So uh, the, the main objective of this talk is to, to provide a, a little bit of an alternative uh, approach there, which I, at least in my opinion, is a bit more systematic. So uh, what, what we will have today is, so the whole talk is, is more or less geared towards, uh, say, new PhD students who, who wants to start uh, working in this field. And I, I think we have a few of you in, in the Wingrid project. Uh, so uh, we will start first with uh, an overview of these uh, problems uh, related to converter control and grid interaction and so on in a, a very brief tutorial. So this was once uh, prepared for uh, uh, what is called a Sigre Green Book. So this is kind of the, the PowerPoint version of that. And uh, part number two is uh, a more uh, detailed uh, part on on say how to apply modal analysis to uh, converter-based power systems and uh, there is a, a big chunk of that is about modeling of the, the main challenge is often the modeling it's not the analysis itself and uh, looking brief overview of uh, what the, these very well-known mathematical foundations are when it comes to, to modal analysis we have used them for many years in, in power systems and uh, and then look at a little bit at some special types of analysis that are, are relevant for converter based uh, power systems. So this was originally presented in a conference as a tutorial uh, in the EPE conference 2018 in, in Riga. So if you were there and went to the tutorial, you would hear the same thing. Uh, third section is about uh, modeling. Uh, so I work primarily in on our high power converters like uh, HVDC and FACTS and so on. And there uh, we are using uh, nowadays uh, mod uh, modular multi-level converters. And uh, those re require a special treatment uh, when you want to apply stability analysis and uh, uh, and modal analysis, so, so I will have a special section of that. So this is more or less a new, new section, and then look at some of the case studies. So one offshore wind farm, which is this section is inspired by the work on uh, uh, an HVDC project called Barwin One, uh, which was uh, the first uh, HVDC connected offshore wind farm in the North Sea. There were some some rather large harmonic issues uh, that we later managed to solve using uh, the type of methods I will be talking about. And then another case study on uh, the distributed energy resources. So, and um, I, I can warn you that possibly it, the talk will be a little bit longer than uh, than three hours. So, but. Uh, the talk is also modular, so you can you can skip one bit or you can drop out early and you should still uh, get something sensible out of it. And um, uh, so I also want to encourage you, so I don't think we need to be in a hurry, so I would encourage you to, to actually interrupt me at all times and ask questions rather than just me uh, talking all the time. Uh, so, so, but I think uh, this part is pretty clear, so I will jump over here to the first, uh, first section. So, 
So, so this section uh, will basically be discussing now as uh, power electronics. It's it's very important today for the the power grid. It's also very important for Hitachi ABB power grids because uh, a large chunk of our project portfolio involve power electronics and uh, converters. And uh, as you may know, we are uh, probably the world leader in HVDC technology. Uh, uh, together with, I, I, if I'm generous, I can say we do, we are together with Siemens, the leader. Uh, and um, uh, so, so uh, power electronics come in uh, very often in our work. And my special pa part of this, so I, I'm originally a control engineer, so I'm looking after the control part, not so much uh, uh, the hardware part, uh, the physical layout of converters and so on. Uh, we will talk about a phenomena called harmonic resonance and how that uh, can affect converter control and uh, looking at uh, what type of analysis techniques are, are usually used for this uh, purpose. And uh, actually this will not be in, that will come as a case study in the end. Uh, so, so first looking into here, uh, where do we have power electronics in the grid? So if we look at 15 years back, more or less at the time where when I started working for uh, Hitachi ABB power grids, uh, then uh, we, we did already then have some power electronics in the grid, like uh, we had some maybe controlled uh, serious compensation, we had statcoms, uh, we have used uh, power electronics based static frequency converters for a very long time for rails uh, and so on. But most of these uh, power electronics solutions, they were based on this older technology, thyristo based technology where uh, that are grid commutated. So they cannot switch faster than uh, the grid frequency. It also means that uh, you can't really implement any really fast controls. So, so at, at that time, uh, this first introduction of power electronics was quite straightforward. We didn't need to consider uh, control interactions very much between different units because of these uh, low bandwidth controls and uh, uh, simply that there wasn't so many devices. But if, if we see what the grid looks like already today, uh, we have uh, power electronics in a lot more places, like we have the wind converters, we have solar converters, uh, we have uh, we have a product for a, a variable speed generator where we uh, we have a small back to uh, have a back to back converter to be able to run the hydro turbine at, at variable speed. And uh, we, we have then a lot of of storage in the medium voltage grid, also even on transmission grid or energy storage. And most of these new converters are based on, on voltage source converter technology. And uh, there we use, we, we force the switching so that uh, we can use a very high bandwidth of the control if we need to. And uh, this then, means that sometimes we do control in the same frequency range where we have uh, resonances in the grid. And uh, the, this can result in problems if it's not properly managed. So, uh, so how I got into this topic was uh, this story about the Bowen one uh, wind farm. So uh, this was, uh, uh, it is uh, the, the onshore station of that uh, of the HVDC connection to that wind farm is in, in northern Germany, where we have about say there is 20 kilometers of land cable and uh, 80 kilometers of of uh, sea cable, and there we have the the offshore HVDC station and. Uh, this was a pioneering project and uh, uh, installing and uh, commissioning the HVDC station was actually 
surprisingly straightforward. They did it on time. Everything was working. Uh, there was a lot of uh, delay in the installation of wind turbines, mainly because of weather conditions and so on. So we didn't have all the wind turbines uh, commissioned uh, at the time the HVDC station was commissioned. Uh, but eventually uh, the, the wind turbines came online. And when we had around half of the wind turbines online, uh, we started measuring this type of grid grid voltage. Uh, I will switch to my pointer. So, so like you see here, uh, we, we uh, this is a uh, should should supposedly be a sinusoidal 50 hertz voltage, but on top of that, there is about 20 percent uh, THD uh, of uh, not. Uh, exactly uh, a fifth or seventh harmonic, but uh, rather uh, an interharmonic at around 290 hertz. And uh, this happened once we started getting about more than 200 megawatt production in the farm. And uh, uh, the farm total farm size was 400 megawatts. So basically we, we, we couldn't go beyond half the projected uh, uh, production. And uh, this, uh, before this, uh, when this project was, uh, was planned, you do harmonic studies and, and so on, standard studies. And uh, those harmonic studies predicted about a 2% uh, harmonic distortion. So what we measured in reality was 10 times more. So clearly there was some other explanation for what, what's going on than uh, this classical static harmonic load flow problem that uh, that we were used to. And uh, it resulted then in very long outages. So uh, we uh, at ABB, uh, that uh, what the company was called at the time, uh, we did, we uh, dimensioned those filters for 5% uh, harmonic distortion, believing we would have then a safety factor over two. Uh, but when they were exposed to 20% THD, then uh, uh, the filters were damaged and uh, caused long outages uh, to the station. And uh, at that time, then, there was not really a, a good understanding of this, of the types of problems we are talking about today. And uh, it's actually now a very, very uh, important academic and industry problems. You can see here a list of active working groups uh, looking into controller interactions and, uh, and these things. Uh, so let's first look into uh, how these things can happen. So uh, first we need to understand this concept of uh, harmonic resonance. So uh, you, you can look at, uh, at this figure here where we have a grid connection. Uh, we have some grid impedance there. We may have some transformer in the, say, for example, in a distribution grid or a, and a capacitor bank here for uh, power factor correction. And uh, when we connect devices to this system, for example, uh, generators or uh, converters, injecting current into the network, we always connect them in, in a physical location. And from each of these physical locations, uh, the in input impedance will look different. So uh, we can calculate here this input impedance seen from the harmonic source. Uh, we might get uh, an impedance curve that looks like this uh, with a very strong peak. Uh, we may have some some valley here, so you always see these peaks and uh, the valleys in in pairs, and uh, those are those are significant for harmonic injection. So think about what would happen if if this harmonic source uh, behaves as a current source. So it's forcing current in, maybe through some control system that uh, makes it behave uh, behave like a current source. Uh, uh, and if we 
if we inject harmonics here exactly at, at that parallel resonance frequency. So even a small uh, harmonic injection will give us a huge uh, harmonic distortion in the voltage. The same same so analog, analogous problem could be that uh, if this has some control system here uh, that makes it behave as a voltage source in the harmonic domain, and so we have a, a fixed harmonic voltage here, and we happen to inject harmonics exactly on this series resonance frequency, the valley. Uh, even a small voltage will give us a huge current, and that could also cause damage to equipment and uh, uh, be a big problem. And uh, so we will look at this uh, here with a, a very simple example. Uh, so we have a grid to the left here, two cables, cable models. Uh, and uh, to this, uh, we have a point of common coupling where we connect a, a converter system. And uh, this converter system here, it has a control system that is uh, quite similar to what you, you would see in a wind turbine, for example, or a solar PV panel with the current control and uh, PLL and all these things. Uh, and if I if I run a simulation of this system here, uh, here you can see the the phase uh, phase A voltage measured at the PCC, and uh, it starts nicely here. We expect to have a, a sinusoidal with 50 or 60 hertz here, uh, and at this point here, I disconnect one of those two cables. Uh, we can see here that once when I do the disconnection, there is a little bit of transient, but everything looks fine. Uh, we go back to something look, uh, that looks normal, but slowly here we can see there is something, a harmonic component is growing. And uh, to see uh, what, um, what that actually is, uh, it's useful to look at the, the Fourier transform of this voltage. So. Here is the to the upper picture here, we have the Fourier transformed voltage for uh, uh, taken in this time period before the disturbance. And uh, we can see we have some fifth harmonic, there is a little bit of seventh harmonic uh, we have here around the switching frequency, we have uh, harmonics. But, but after the cable disconnection, so here I've taken uh, the Fourier transform of the voltage in, in this region here, we see we have a, a different picture. Uh, we still have the, uh, the switching harmonics, but on top of that, there is a huge harmonic distortion here at about 1.7 kilohertz. And uh, this is because something in the control system here has gone unstable when, it, uh, when the grid changed. So how do we analyze these things? So for the understanding, it's, it's very, uh, this impedance equivalencing is a very, very useful tool. So impedance equivalencing can be used here to represent a part of the grid, either uh, a part of this total system, either the grid side or the converter side as an equivalent impedance. So we can look at the PCC here and simply measure the impedance seen to the left to get an, an impedance equivalent of the grid, or we can measure the impedance to the right here to get an impedance or admittance equivalent of the converter system. And uh, that gives us this representation here that uh, the impedance is basically the transfer function uh, modeling how the grid response to a small current injection, a small incremental current injection, and what the incremental effect that would have in the voltage. And uh, other way around for the, the admittance part here, where we would be thinking about applying a small voltage perturbation and see how the current would change. And uh, those can be represented here by impedance matrices. So for the uh, for the grid side here, we can see a typical, uh, or we can see the imp impedance 
calculated for the grid side here uh, the positive sequence impedance. So normally also in these types of study, usually we, we assume we have symmetrical systems, so we only need to look at the, the positive sequence. But uh, there is a clear resonance here uh, at this point that would shift a little bit depending on whether I have one or two cables in operation. Uh, for the converter system, it's a little bit more complicated because uh, there uh, usually you, you have more or less the same behavior or uh, at least in the passive components you have the same behavior in the positive and negative sequence. But we have a control system here that uh, introduces coupling between positive and negative sequence. So uh, we need to represent this with uh, uh, say a full impedance matrix with four elements for positive sequence, negative sequence, and the couplings in between. So, so that, that could look like uh, the figure here. And um, the first line of analysis uh, that I find is very, very useful is uh, something we call the passivity analysis. And uh, passivity analysis you can apply to either a grid system, for example. Uh, you would often end, you would end up in a picture like this here. It's completely green all the way. And uh, this green color here indicates that we have passivity. So I will come to what passivity means in, in a little while. And uh, we also calculate something we call uh, an R index. And R, uh, the R index is a, is a measure of how passive a system is. Uh, for a converter system, the picture often looks like this. So you, we have, a, for low frequencies, we have an active region up to some, some frequency here. Uh, and then you have some passive region. And then the non-passive behavior comes back at high frequency. Uh, so the, this non-passive region here, it is uh, at low frequencies. It's basically dictated by our requirements. We have a lot of requirements in terms of how the converter system should respond to voltage disturbances on the grid. Uh, we should be able to ride through faults and, and things like this. So it actually forces us to, to make the control, uh, uh, say, to, uh, I mean, to, to have a certain amount of, of performance that uh, allows us to meet grid code requirements. And that basically implies we also need to be non-passive. Uh, the upper region here is uh, often due to that we have always time delay. So we do sampling and so on in the control system. And uh, that typically translates into time delay. And uh, that our that time delay translates into uh, non-passivity. And uh, so, if we, if we look at the, here the, the physical interpretation interpretation of what passivity is, so uh, say that you have here a, an impedance or admittance equivalent of a piece of equipment, you would assume here that we inject a little bit, or we make a, a current perturbation or a voltage perturbation, and. Uh, that will uh, result in a certain movement in the system. And uh, we can calculate here, uh, given when we know the imped impedance matrix here, uh, we can calculate uh, the power flowing into, uh, into this subsystem. And if that power is, um, is positive, it means that uh, the device is absorbing power. So, if you have an, a resonance excited in the grid, uh, your device in the regions where it's passive, it will dissipate the energy in those uh, disturbances or oscillations and, and damp them out. Uh, on the other hand, if you are non-passive, so if uh, the power is negative, it means that you might be amplifying such uh, variations uh, at resonance frequencies and uh, contribute to, to an instability. And uh, there are some quite simply, uh, this, uh, 
this function or there is a function to calculate this R index. It's, it's in MATLAB. So if you have the, uh, the impedance representation as a transfer function matrix, you can very easily calculate uh, passivity. And uh, it's a very useful tool for, uh, for the control design. Uh, so the the second okay we can uh, we can look here now actually explaining what went wrong in the the previous example here uh, and explain that uh, using uh, the concept of of passivity. So here is our uh, our test network again. Uh, we have computed here. Uh, an impedance equivalent of the grid and admittance equivalent of the, the converter system. And uh, if I know those two, I can just calculate here the parallel equivalent impedance seen from the PCC. So I, I can invert my uh, impedance matrix sum with the admittance matrix and then invert again and I get an equivalent impedance. And um, this is what you see here to the right plotted with the uh, the two curves here. Uh, one here is with one cable in operation where if you, you remember from the previous slide, we were unstable. And uh, in one case, uh, we have two, the other case, we have two cables in operation. And uh, it's a little bit tricky to see here, but this, you see that here, this, resonance is clearly in the area where we have active behavior of the converter system. So it basically means that the converter system is uh, feeding, it's seeing these uh, variations at the resonance frequency and it's constantly feeding more energy into it. So uh, we are creating, it's contributing to this instability. Whereas uh, with the curve, with the impedance calculated for the case with two cables, we are not in the active region. So, and um, uh, so, so the uh, this amplification does not occur. So, so this this passivity, it's a, it's quite useful tool to really understand what's going on in these uh, these cases with instability. However, it's not really very practical for large scale uh, studies or uh, for a system level analysis where we want to say see whether our converter system is stable for a particular grid. So the, the first um, first way of doing this analysis is uh, what we call the impedance based stability analysis. It, it's based on these impedance and admittance matrices and uh, you can see uh, here if you you know your grid impedance matrix and your your converter admittance matrix, you can create here a feedback connection, and it, it can be shown that uh, uh, if you can look at the stability of this feedback connection, it's equivalent to having the stability of this original model you used to calculate your impedance matrices, and. Um, once you once you have that, we can apply Nyquist criterion. So if you have scalar impedance matrices, you can use the, the standard Nyquist criterion. But usually we use positive negative sequence or DQ impedance matrices. And so you would use something called the, the generalized Nyquist criterion. And uh, this can be used here to uh, calculate how much gain margin you have and how much phase margin you have. And uh, this is fairly straightforward here. If you have a simple system with a single PCC, uh, you can just, you know where to break the system up in, in subsystems and uh, everything becomes very straightforward. Uh, however, in a practical situations, uh, for example, uh, I have been doing a lot of studies in offshore wind farms. There you may have, uh, uh, a hundred of these different PCCs. So you, you need then to calculate an impedance, equivalent impedance seen from every wind turbine and apply this analysis over and over again. So uh, uh, this makes this 
kind of rather impractical to use uh, in, in practical studies, even though it, it can give you a lot of, of insight. Uh, so for this uh, system level analysis, I, I'm mainly working with uh, what we call eigenvalue based analysis or modal analysis. It's, uh, it's the same type of mathematics that we have used for study of inter-area oscillations and subsynchronous resonance in, in, in power network, I, I guess since the, the 70s or 80s. And um, this workflow is based here on, again, on a model. So we build a model of uh, our network to study. Uh, we use that model to, uh, uh, we use that, that model here to generate uh, a nonlinear, nonlinear model, state space model, uh, which would have then a state upstate function here called f. And we can calculate here the Jacobian of this f with respect to the states, and we get a system matrix A. And uh, the uh, stability of our closed loop system here can be inferred from eigenvalues and eigenvectors of, of that uh, A matrix. So the, uh, the result of, of this modal analysis comes out on this form you see here in, in the middle, where we have uh, uh, we have we detect here a number of resonance mode. Each resonance mode will have a, a certain damping and a certain frequency, and uh, uh, we get here two pairs. So the the crosses here are the resonance modes with two cables in operation and uh, the uh, stars relates to the when we have one cable in operation so so if with one cable of operation we can see here that some of the two of the resonance mode here are have a negative damping and negative damping means unstable and uh, so this modal decomposition, so this will be the topic of the, the second talk here, uh, how, how this works. And um, other thing you can extract from this, uh, when you calculate the eigenvalues of this A matrix, you also get uh, eigenvectors. And eigenvectors can be used to calculate something called participation factors. And those participation factors can be used, say, to uh, do root cause analysis and figure out what part, uh, say, which parts of the original model, which control loop, uh, which grid element is mainly to, re to related to uh, to an instability that you can see. So to, to conclude here, this first very, uh, very brief overview, uh, we, we can see here that when we have resonances in the grid, this can, can give us quite big challenges to convert the control. We need to consider them when we do the design of the converter. And, uh, uh, but if, if you know about these resonances, uh, you can quite often manage at least the low frequency resonances quite well uh, with control. Uh, once resonances that come high up in frequency that are uh, in frequency ranges uh, mapping to the, the time delay of the converters, it may be more tricky to handle them with control. So we may actually need to, to use a defensive tuning and look at uh, passive filter solutions to, to manage that. Uh, yeah, we didn't mention it in the talk, but the, if you if you inspect the slide, you would see here that modal analysis and impedance analysis they they provide results that are completely consistent. But uh, at least in my opinion, I, I prefer not to use impedance based analysis for for this reason of of computational and uh, complexity. So so that wraps up. I hear there were some things. I don't know if that those were questions because I don't see the <laughs> see okay. the chat uh, when I'm presenting. Right. Uh, so but otherwise right. it's a good good time to stop for a few questions. Right. So it's good. Uh, um, Matt, that's a very 
very good overview and introductions. Um, we would open this talk up to this point to question and answer. So are there anyone uh, having some questions on on what uh, Matt has uh, spoken so far? Just, uh, you know, uh, open your mic and you know, say what you want to ask. Yes, there is one, uh, Benam Nori, yes. Uh, yes, uh, I'm Benam Nori from the Technical University of Denmark. Thank you for the very uh, fruitful presentation. Actually, I, I'm wondering if uh, if there is uh, somehow inspected the validation of the models, like, uh, for example, uh, e either the impedance-based models or the item values. Uh, what would be the challenges for the validation of such models? Yeah, yeah. So I basically hear that uh, we are talking about these impedance matrices here. And uh, there are different ways of, of getting to those. So one is uh, uh, for the grid side, we often use uh, models. So we know the topology of the grid. Uh, we have say either detailed or approximate information about uh, the frequency dependency of the parameters here that uh, it is usually quite straightforward here to calculate uh, at least a frequency dependent model of the grid. Uh, how accurate that is, of course, it's, it's another issue. Uh, but uh, for the, the converter system, we, uh, we typically use, uh, say, a model based approach. So uh, at, uh, we, we actually build the converter. So we know in detail the, the data of the different uh, components so for example for a transformer we we can we can measure in the lab and, and do component validation component by combin uh, component and then aggregate all those components here uh, i think what what is a one research topic here that is more or less an open field here is the this validation of the grid impedances because uh, we do have models, but we don't really know how accurate they are. So if you go beyond, say, 2.5 kilohertz or 5 kilohertz, uh, it starts getting very tricky. And uh, what you need to do then is that you need to make sure we have uh, some level of <clears throat> conservativeness. Okay. And uh, but for us as a manufacturer, our approach here is uh, often, say, this uh, model aggregation, try to figure out uh, the data for each component and then aggregate it. But for a, for a power utility, for example, or a TSO who buys equipment, they usually do it in a different way. So uh, they, uh, they want, say, either black box models here that can calculate this uh, impedance matrix or they use measurement approaches to, to calculate these uh, admittance matrices by uh, perturbation experiments. Good, Matt. So uh, next question, please uh, introduce yourself and approach. Right, if there is no uh, hands on, Matt, can I ask you a couple of uh, doubts that I have? Yes. Right. Uh, also, I mean, we have one uh, activities. I mean, as you initially said that, you know, the ball in wind farm, uh, when that 200 megawatt uh, could, could never become 400 megawatt because of all those, uh, you know, these um, instability issues. We started working on the um, Alstom grid uh, project Dolwyn 3. And mm. there we did a detailed modeling. Um, and there it's all a series of projects. And we found that it was uh, more of the resonance instability than of harmonics. Because also in your slide, you showed something as 290 hertz. So mm. which is not coming as any multiple of, you know, 50, mm. 60 that way. Mm. So our conclusion was that it was more to do with the um, wind farm 
the grid transformer like where about the 33 kv cables uh, are being uh, brought into this uh, big transformers on the platform uh, floating mm. platform and then it goes to mm. 132 kv or whatever you know uh, 140 uh, kv mm. ac so those transformers they are inductance and then cable capacitance mm. uh, depending on the length uh, yeah. that wind field so you have a you know kind of frequency Sometimes it can be close to the third harmonics. Sometimes it can be close to the seventh harmonics mm. and uh, second harmonics like that in, in DQ, uh, you know, reference frame. Yeah. So it is it's not still clear actually that whether we can call it as an harmonic instability or a resonant instability. Harmonic instability can be the cause of the switching of your converters, where mm. the switching uh, frequency will have some kind of multiplicity uh, with the mm. power frequency. Yeah. Whereas the resonance can be even without any harmonics, uh, but we have a cables and which has got inductance and capacitance and, and its electrical characteristics purely can pose as a, uh, you know, as you showed in your impedance, um, uh, yeah. you, know, in, in, you know, in that uh, picture. Yeah. So it can be like this. So, so that is uh, the thing that I wanted to ask you, sir. How do we then distinguish between harmonic, harmonic instability or Instead, mm. due to resonance. Yeah. So, so the uh, uh, I mean, the topics are 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 very, very much connected. Mm. And uh, the uh, but I think one important point that you make there is uh, that if you you have here a system where you you connect different components, you never get a resonance that you can calculate using a. You cannot calculate the location of the the resulting resonance using only one subsystem model. You can only see it once you see the connection of all the components. Uh, then you will know exactly where the resonance is. And in this Baldwin case, uh, it turned out that uh, if you if you look at the HVDC system in isolation, there is no resonance at 290 hertz. If you look at the cable system or with the wind turbines connected, there is no resonance at 290 hertz, but when you connect the things together, ah. there was a resonance at 290 hertz. And uh, there uh, you you have this, uh, these, these were uh, doubly fed induction generators. And uh, doubly fed induction generators, they inject, say, harmonics at the, the classical even harmonic frequencies from the grid side converter, but also in other frequencies due to, uh, say, this decoupling between the rotor of the machine and uh, so that there was actually harmonic injection on, on this frequency that, that no one really thought about. Uh -huh. so, so then, uh, but luckily that was, I will, that will come in this final section. Luckily that 290 hertz, it's in a, in a region where we have very good controllability. So once you know about it, and, and it's quite straightforward to, to manage it. Yeah, yeah, control. We also did that. Uh, so, but but back again here to the this connection between, um, uh, say, what is steady state harmonic analysis and what is uh, harmonic stability, and uh, you know, one there is probably many definitions here. But one thing you could say that you would uh, say an an harmonic instability it would uh, it would present itself in an infinite uh, static harmonic amplification. Oh. So th that's one way of seeing the connection. So and uh, when you do modal analysis, we get damping uh, as uh, each resonance mode gets a damping. And that damping is a very good indicator of what your uh, harmonic, your steady state harmonic uh, amplification will be. Oh. TSD, TSD values. Yeah. Yeah, there's a, at least the amplification you can get from the damping. And once you know the injection as well, you can get the THD. So if you go back to that slide nine again, I, I also had another point to ask is, yes. so uh, the, the point of common coupling, you had a slide number nine. This one? Y yes, yes. So so this is about the impedance uh, you know, estimations. So at the point of common coupling, uh, and you are giving, uh, say, uh, in the bottom delta V by delta I. So now at depending on the relative say capacity 
of the grid on the left and also the uh, capacity of the uh, power converters, mm. uh, whether it is coming uh, from a wind farm or something. So getting the impedance estimated would be tricky for two reasons. I mean, we, we experienced when I want to, uh, you know, share your uh, view on that. Like mm. if you if you have a strong grid and then put a current source at the point of common coupling with certain frequencies as J omega, mm. Yeah. So then what happens is that uh, current source, uh, majority of the current actually gets absorbed by the grid side. So it does not excite the uh, frequency domain behavior of the converters because it doesn't get enough signals. Yeah. So we did something with the, having, rather than having a current source, we put a voltage with some mm. uh, appropriate frequency and we, we did that. But mm. then what we realized that, you know, because you're talking about the MMC converters, uh, unless you represent uh, all their control and the delays, the impedance that you are getting is not actually the actual impedance. And, and what is your thought about it? You said that control is uh, bringing the coupling between the positive and negative sequence. That is absolutely fine. Yeah. Uh, the modulations. Now, for MMC, there would be this capacitor charge balancing mechanism in mm. every module. Now that balancing mechanism itself is a dynamics of a frequency range, which one cannot ignore. Mm. So that is creating a lot of complications. So I just wanted to have your uh, view on that. Did you have some? Yeah, so I, I have not worked much with the, say, this measurement based approach where you would get these matrices via uh, experiments. Ah. So, so I'm, I'm working mainly, say, uh, uh, at least as a manufacturer, we know where we have all the delays and we, we know exactly uh, what we have in each control loops. So, so we are working mainly, say, on this model-based approach where we are. Uh, but of course, like you say, you should not forget to include a delay and so on, because then uh, the model you get will not make sense. And yeah, uh, I is... think that's also connected to this question about validation. So uh, it's always useful to to actually validate the, the analytical models we are using. Well, we are working on that, particularly the delay has impact on the that stability margin that you also do through Nyquist or generalized mm -hmm. Nyquist. And it can be, uh, you know, having a different margin with the same grid strength, <laughs> if you consider the, consider the delay or if you don't consider the delay. Yeah, yeah. Of, I mean, it's, uh, yeah. you, you can even have, so uh, that will be in the next section of the talk. How, oh, how oh, do we sorry. model sorry, this yeah. uh, delay? Like you can depend, you need to approximate the delays. Uh, and depending on how you do that approximation, you may predict a stable system or a, a, an unstable system. So it's very, very important there to think about uh, that the models we are using are actually applicable in the frequency range we are going to use them. Well, thank you. I, mean, I, I really asked you two long questions and we have yeah. taken time. But I, but, uh, I, I,